Thank you for joining us today at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. It's a blessing that you're here with us to join us online. It's a blessing for those of you who are here in person. If you open your Bibles, please, to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to begin reading from there in a few minutes. Now, the service that we had posted online last week was titled, the title of the service was, How to Know if You're Saved or Lost. How to Know if You're Saved or Lost. And as we are getting into this Operation Heal America revival, I will tell you that revival is not for lost people. Revival is for saved people. Revival is where saved people who have drifted away from God or their hearts aren't as close to the Lord as they once were for them to be able to come back, to start to think about the things of God, want the things of God in their lives, want to be close to God, want the things of God in our society. That's revival. So as we started out our Operation Heal America Year 3, the title of the message, Are You Saved? or How to Know if You're Saved or Lost, if you have any doubts about your salvation. If you just don't know, if you, you, you're missing that peace in your heart and you just wonder, am I truly saved? Go back and check that service online. You can find it on our YouTube channel. You can hear it um, off of our off of our church website uh, in the audio. You can uh, listen to the audio on there, but get that settled in your heart. Figure out and get that settled if you're saved. And if you are saved, we need to start living for God. And so this message today, this message of revival, this is not for saved people. I mean, it's not for lost people, I'm sorry. Lost people don't need to be revived. Saved people need to be revived. So this week, we're not going to be talking so much to lost people as we're going to be talking to saved people. We're talking to the church this week, and we want to experience revival as a church. Second Chronicles chapter seven if you would please stand for the reading of God's word in verse 14 please stand for the reading of God's word second Chronicles chapter 7 God says in his word in verse 14 if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land shall we pray our Father and our God, we thank Thee, Lord, for sparing our lives on this side of eternity another day, and I thank Thee, Lord, for giving me another chance to be able to preach from this pulpit. Lord, I pray that You will be with me as I bring this message and service today, Lord. I pray, Lord, that You will not let Satan get a bid in on this service, Father, that You will keep me clear and concise as I'm speaking. I pray, Lord, that despite all of the sins that I commit in my life, Father, that the Holy Spirit of God will fall fresh on me today as I bring this service. Help it to be a challenging service that will help our church and for those people who listen to us online. Hide us now behind the cross, Father, and fill us all with the power of the Holy Ghost of God. If we ask these things in Jesus' name and just for his sake, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now this week, getting into 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, a verse that you're very familiar with by now, this being the third year that we have done this Operation Heal America Revival. We're going to be talking about what is probably the most foundational element to experience spiritual revival in our lives. It is the foundation for experiencing personal revival, and it is the foundation for experiencing corporate revival. It's the starting place. It's the first step. And if you miss this step, church, you will never experience revival. You will never experience nearness to God. You will never experience revival or being near to God in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your church or in your community. What is this step? Well, that verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which we are all very familiar with by now, says, If my people which are called by my name shall read it to me. What's that first phrase? What is it? So humble themselves. Humble themselves. Humility. That's the thing that every one of us says that they want. That thing that most of us don't realize how much we lack or need. We see the absence of humility in other people. But more than that, we have an absence of seeing the need for humility in our own lives. 
So in our sermon this week, we're going to be talking about humility and its converse, pride. The converse of humility is pride. And as we look at the subject of pride, having pride and being prideful, we will see what it is that God needs in order to change our hearts and what we need to repent of in order to have a humble heart. Now, if you turn to Isaiah chapter 57 and in verse 15, we're going to be reading uh, from some uh, a little bit from that verse there. We're going to come back to it a little bit later. But in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 15, now this verse te uh, teaches us and tells us how important God views humil uh, sorry, humility. Isaiah 57 verse 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. It says here, he says, I dwell in the high and holy place. Notice that the references to God in this verse in Isaiah, that he is high, that he is holy. He is high, he is elevated. He is lofty, he dwells in the high and holy place. He is exalted, he is elevated. He is high up above us. And God says, I dwell, the place where I live is this high and holy place. He is further above us than we can even possibly begin to understand and imagine. But then he says something else. There's a comma in this verse. Comma meaning also, okay? If there's a comma, there is also another part that goes with it. Also, there is another place where God dwells. Verse 15, continuing, he says, uh, There is another place he dwells. It says, There is another place where I live besides the high and holy place. And he says that he also dwell, dwells with him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. God says, I live in this high and holy place above anything that you can think or imagine, but I also live or I uh, am close to or can't come close to those who have a humble spirit or a contrite spirit. That word contrite means when you stop justifying your wrong decisions. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, the definition of contrite says when you're broken hearted about your sin, when you're deeply affected with the grief or sorrow for having offended God. It is a repentant spirit. It is a spirit that feels sorry for having grieved God for sins. That is a contrary spirit. Verse 15 says that God will dwell with those who have a humble or a contrite spirit. And he continues to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So listen to me, church, as we get into this today. Do you want to experience revival? Are, are you feeling the closest to God that you have ever felt in your life? You are? Oh, well, I'm good. I'm glad that you are. As everybody else, I know sometimes I don't feel as close to God every day as I have at one point in your life. And if you are saved and you are not closer to God today than you used to be, then you need revival. You need revival in your heart, and that revival needs to be able to spread to our church. So if you want to experience revival in your life, the starting place is a contrite spirit. If you want to experience revival in your home, in your marriage, with your children, in your church, in your community, the starting place is a humble, contrite, broken heart. So God, who is on high and lifted up, basically in order for him to come down to us, to dwell with us, he pretty much in effect has to stoop down to meet with those who have a lowly and a humble spirit. Now, we mentioned in the beginning that the converse of humility was pride, having pride, is the opposite of having a humble spirit. So we're going to take a talk for a little while and a little bit today about pride. What is pride? What does it look like? How does God feel about pride? How can we identify evidences of pride in our own lives? First one, what is pride? What is pride? Pride is self-exaltation. God says, I am the high one. I am the lofty one. Pride is when we say, I am the high one. Pride is when we say, I am the lofty one. 
That was Satan's first sin in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. That's what got Satan kicked out of heaven. Verse 12 of that passage. He said, I will exalt myself. I will be like the Most High. Verse 14 of that passage. Self-exaltation. Pride is lifting ourselves up. Lifting ourselves up. Because when we lift ourselves up, by default, we bring God down. And isn't that what our whole world system does today? It lifts man up, it deifies man, and it humanizes God. I was talking to someone uh, just the other day at Michael's. Uh, someone had made a comment about what I was going to be preaching about this week. And I told them I was going to be talking about pride. And somehow the conversation evolved into how people need to have, uh, have self-esteem. And we need to value ourselves. And we need to think highly of ourselves. And when I made a comment about that's not what it teaches in God's word someone else said you know in, in a way that we humanize god say well god he would want us to think better of ourselves because we're made in his image and so the more we think of ourselves then the more like god we are but that's the way that we humanize god we try to understand god on a way that we think and that we understand humanizing god while at the same time lifting ourselves up deifying man bringing god down to our level trying to bring us up to his level pride is a sense of self-importance it's my world revolving around me pride is self-centeredness it is self-absorption it's all those self words where we get selfish from pride is that it's all those words about self jonathan edwards was a preacher who lived from 1703 to 1758 he is most notably remembered for preaching a sermon titled sinners in the hands of an angry god perhaps you've heard about it other than sermons that you'll find in the bible this is probably the most recognized or um most popular sermon that has been preached in history at least to my knowledge which is regarded by some as the catalyst for the first great awakening or just known as the great awakening jonathan edwards once made this statement he said pride is the first sin that ever entered into the universe and he said it is the last that is rooted out it is god's most stubborn enemy he says, pride is much more difficult to be discerned than any other corruption because of its very nature. That is, pride is a person having too high an opinion of himself. Is it any surprise then that a person who has too high an opinion of himself is unaware of it? If you're thinking pretty highly of yourself, you're probably not thinking that you have a problem with pride. You're most often unaware that you're even going along with it. Again, as I said earlier, we can see pride in others. We can look at family members, don't we? We look at family members that we know are full of pride, right? We do. We, we look at them and we talk about them and we kind of judge them in our minds. But how is that, how is that to us? See, pride sees, sees pride in others. But when... We have a high opinion of ourselves. We are unaware of pride in our own lives. Unaware that we do have this opinion. Pride makes us blind. It makes us blind to our failures. It makes us blind to our weaknesses. It makes us blind to our need. Pride makes us think that we're pretty all right. Pride makes us think we, we're, we're, we're pretty something. We got it going on. Now we hear a lot today about self-image and people talking about self-esteem. And, and someone might say, I have a poor self-image or I have poor self-esteem. And, and the teaching of the secular world that people say is that they, 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 you can't think this way. You have to have a positive self-image and a high level of self-esteem, doesn't it? Doesn't the secular world teaches that? Well, according to the scripture, the problem in our lives is just the reverse. It's that we think so much of ourselves that we get easily wounded when others don't think highly of us. It's the opposite of, you know, why, why we have to have such a high self-esteem, because we get easily wounded. 
because others don't esteem us on the same level that we are. And that's because of our pride. We think so much of ourselves that we get easily wounded. According to the scripture, the root issue in our hearts, the strive to be in control, the strive to have my world revolve around me, the strive to have things work in a way that I want them to work. That's what we want. And when things don't work in a way that I want them to work in my life, then I have pity parties. I become demanding. I become controlling. All kinds of ways we manipulate the worlds around us in order to get in control, to be in control of stuff. That's the essence of pride. It's that way one writer said, it's that business of thinking much about ourselves and much of ourselves. Pride is thinking much about ourselves and much of ourselves. Even people with what we would call inferiority complexes or have low self-esteem. What is the way that we're programmed today to think of it in society? It's to think much about ourselves. How I feel, how I fit in, how other people view me to think much about ourselves and much of ourselves john oswald sanders who was a missionary from new zealand who authored more than 40 books on the christian life wrote this egotism or pride is the practice of thinking and speaking much of oneself the habit of magnifying one's attainments or importance it leads one to consider everything in relation to himself rather than in relation to god and the welfare of his people so we're saying how does this affect me the way my spouse is behaving how does this affect me the way my children are acting the way my co-workers are treating me um, the way the weather is uh, the way my health is how does this affect me how does this make me feel rather than what does god think about this what does this how does this make god feel how does this help the welfare or well-being of god's people c.s lewis author of the chronicles of narnia series put it this way in a radio address on bbc in the fall of 1942 he said that the essential vice the utmost evil is pride he says unchastity greed drunkenness and all of that are mere flea bites in comparison it was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. So we could ask ourselves, so just how serious is this pride thing? Just how serious is pride? If you turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 26, and I know sometimes you don't always turn in your Bibles when I do those things, but I, I'd really like you to do this one. If you would, I'd like you to see something here. Proverbs chapter 26. We're going to read a series of verses from Proverbs 26 just to give us a contrast that might help us kind of see how serious a sin that pride really is. Now you're going to notice a word that reoccurs as we read through this passage. Over and over again we see that, and, it, it, and we're going to be looking at the first 12 verses of Proverbs 26, and that word is the word Fool. Fool. This passage of scripture is teaching first about a fool. Verse 1. As snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly or fitting for a fool. Basically, honor doesn't go with a fool the way snow doesn't go with summer. Verse 3. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass or donkey, and a rod for the fool's back. A rod for the back of fools. That's how you have to deal with a fool. I mean, a fool won't listen to counsel. They, they, they won't listen when you try to show them the right way. They, they're just a fool. And the only way you can get the message through is through discipline. You to reprove him, the rod, to make him do what's right, to make him go in the right direction. That's how you have to deal with a fool. Now look at verse 6. He that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off his feet and drinketh damage. It's useless. It's like cutting off your own feet or taking damage unto yourself, uh, or drinking damage unto yourself. You're going to get yourself in trouble if you entrust your message to a fool. 
Verse 7. The legs of the lame are not equal, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Do you remember the man lame on his feet in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 3? He couldn't walk. His legs were useless. It's the same as a wise saying in a fool's mouth. He doesn't understand it, so what good does it do? Verse 8, as he that bindeth a stone in a sling. Now, you know what a sling is. I've got a sling, and I'm slinging it around. It's got the stone in the end. And what do I do with the sling? How did David kill Goliath? He flung it. So what does it mean if I bind the stone in a sling? Basically, I tie it in the sling. So it's not going anywhere. I'm just going to swing it, swing it around my head, and it's not going to do anything. It'd be like a bank robbery, and the bank robbery is in process, and the the robber has hostages, and so the SWAT team comes running into the bank, and all of them have the safeties on on all their guns. And so when the open fire opens up, none of them can do anything. It's useless. And he says, as, as he that bindeth a stone in a sling. Now, the Word of God says, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. It's foolishness. It's like binding a stone in a sling. Verse 9. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. I mean, here's a drunkard. He's, he's stumbling. He's staggering around. He can't walk. He's drunk. He doesn't realize what he's doing. And he trips and he falls accidentally. And he pushes his hand onto a nail or a thorn or a stake or a spike. Or he trips and falls and punctures his hand on something. And, and he, doesn't even, he doesn't even realize it. He doesn't, he doesn't even know what he's doing. He's just oblivious to everything. He doesn't know what's going on. That's like a proverb or a wise saying in the mouth of fools. They have no idea what's going on. Verse 11. Here's a little bit vivid of a word picture for you. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Now, those of you who have dogs, we have dogs, and we have multiple dogs, sometimes they return to each other's vomit. But you know, you know, a, do a dog will, will puke it up, look at it, and then lap it up again. I mean, he just keeps going back to it. And that's the way a fool is. They don't learn from their mistakes. They keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. He keeps going back to it. He just keeps doing it over and over. Now, after reading these first 11 verses, do you want to be a fool? Boy, we have a lot of uh, you know talk going on out here. You don't have to just nod and shake your heads. You can say it out loud. Do you want to be a fool? No. no. You don't want to be a fool. Now, look at verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope of a fool than of him. What's worse than being a fool? It's being proud. How does God view pride? Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, he hates it. He hates pride and arrogance and the evil way. He says in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 5, that one who is proud is an abomination to him. God detests pride. God is the only one who is high and lifted up. And when we exalt ourselves, when we center our world around ourselves, God says, that's an abomination to me. I hate it. Pride could very well be the most heinous sin of which any man or woman could ever be guilty. Sin of pride. Excuse me. Now, we don't tend to think of pride as a sin like that when we think of heinous sins, do we? When we think of the most wicked sins, oh, when, when we think of wicked sin, what comes to mind? What? Murder. Murder. Okay. Stealing. Adultery. Adultery. Sexual sin. All right. You know, when I think of the most heinous sins, I typically think of sexual sins, sexual perversion, alternative sexual lifestyles, gross wickedness that's just widely accepted in our culture around us, right? I mean, we think of things like that. But if you look at Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16 through 19, where God lists seven things that are an abomination to him, you won't even find that stuff mentioned. That sexual sin, you won't even find that mentioned. But what's the very first thing on that list? Pride. A proud look is the very first thing on that list, the sin of pride. 
Psalm 138, verse 6, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he re respect unto the lowly, the humble, but the proud he knoweth afar off. God is high. God says he will stoop down to lift up those who are lowly. He will have respect unto the lowly, those who are humble, those whose worlds are centered around God rather than themselves. But God says if you're proud, if you're haughty, if you're self-centered, if you feel importance about yourself, I'm going to keep you at a distance. He says, I can't draw near to you. I'm going to know you from afar. You're never going to be able to draw close to God until you let his Holy Spirit come and plow up those roots of pride. Those, you know, claw and dig up those roots of pride that exist in your life. Pride is what keeps us far from God. That's what keeps the presence and power of God out of our churches today. It's pride. It's pride. And, and you may say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. Oh, my preacher, he's a really proud man. Or my husband, he sure is a proud man. Or my wife is a very proud person. Or those old people in the church, they're so proud. Or those teenagers, they're just saying you got so much pride. No, God says, don't look at them. Look at your own heart. You want to see what pride looks like? Go look in the mirror. Stop looking at other people. Go look in the mirror. That's what pride looks like. So you say, okay, preacher, I don't want to be proud. I want to be humble. How do I get there? And uh, what do I do about becoming humble? Well, I, I'm glad you asked. I, I'm going to tell you. Actually, that kind of sounded prideful. So I, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let someone else who is a much greater man of God than me tell you. I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis again. Let's hear what he had to say about it. But first, before I quote him, are there any of you that want to acquire humility today? Any of you who would like to be humble? If pride is this something that God hates this much, do any of you, would you like to be on that side or would like, you like to be on the other side? Would you like to be on the humble side? We want to be humble. We say we do anyway. So we're just going to assume, and maybe those of you listening online, I'm just going to take for granted that if you're listening to the service that you want to be humble. C.S. Lewis said, If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. He said, If you think you're not conceited, it means that you are very conceited indeed. Now, most of us probably don't like to hear a quote like that, but I do believe there's a lot of truth in it. And so I've got here some 40 evidences of pride in one's life. And, and I'm going to go through this list of just ways that we can try to identify pride that exists in our lives that you might not have already thought or think that you have. Now, as I go through this list, it, it's a nice list, um, you know, I don't recommend you write it down here because there won't be time with the speed I'm going to go through it. But you can always look up the sermon online. You can listen to it on our website. If you're watching it online, certainly you can rewind it, write these note, this list down, take some notes. Those of you who are here in person, if you have a piece of paper and a pen... You might want to just go through and take a, you know, make, you know, if you see something that I say that is an evidence of pride in your life, you might want to make a little check mark or something, or just, actually, some of you, you probably are too prideful to do that. You don't want other people to look around and see where you have faults. So maybe just try to kind of keep a little mental tally. But we're going to go through this list, some characteristics that you might see in your life, maybe you see something, you know, that, that the Spirit of God might point a finger at your heart or prick your conscience. And, and he says, I might see that in you sometimes, or generally, or all of the time. Or maybe these are characteristics, evidences of pride in your lives that the Spirit of God will convict you and your conscience of. That will help us as, as Christians identify issues of pride, areas we need to work on and repent of in our lives in order that God can draw close to us. Question number one. Do you look down on those who are less educated than you? Less affluent? Less refined? less proper or less successful than yourself? 
Question two, do you think of yourself as more spiritual than other people? More spiritual than your spouse? Or people in your church? Or your friends, people in the workplace? Other believers in the Lord, other brothers and sisters in Christ, do you think of yourself as more spiritual than other believers you know? Next question, do you have a judgmental spirit towards others that don't make the same lifestyle choices that you do? Do you have a judgmental spirit toward others that don't make the same lifestyle choices that you do, same, or, or, or the same dress standards that you have, how other people dress differently or might dress less modestly than you do, or what school or high school your kids go to compared to other people's kids? Maybe my kids are going to a better performing school than someone else's kids, or my kids go to private school, theirs go to public school. Do you... Do you have a judgmental spirit because of that standard? What about entertainment standards? The music, the movies, the TV programs that you either allow or do not allow your family to see compared to how other people, other believers you know. And do you tend to have a judgmental spirit? And maybe you don't think you do, but if you really want to be sure of some of this, maybe you should just ask someone who knows you pretty well if you have a judgmental spirit and ask them do I come across that way is ha as having a judgmental spirit towards those who have a different lifestyle choices than I do next question are you quick to find fault with others and to verbalize those thoughts to others do you have a sharp critical tongue Jonathan Edwards, whom I already quoted, wrote a powerful, convicting piece on evidences of spiritual pride. This was one of the ones he mentioned in that, fault-finding. He, he said, spiritual pride causes us to speak of other people's sins, while humility disposes us to either be silent about them or to speak about them with grief. Think about it. Do you talk about other people's sins? He says... The spiritually proud person shows that in finding fault with other sins that they're low in grace, how cold and dead they are, how quick to discern and notice others' deficiencies. And we can do that and sound so pious, so spiritual. People in our church, they're so cold, they're so dead, we might say. Isn't that just a reflection of pride in our own hearts? To say that and look down on other people? Edwards continues, he says, Christian humility causes a person to take notice of everything that is good in others, to make the best of it and diminish their failings. He says the truly humble Christian has so much to do at home and has so much evil in his own heart that he's not apt to be very busy with other people's hearts. Fault finding. Do you find fault with the lives of other, other people, other believers? Next question. Do you frequently correct or criticize people? Do you frequently correct or criticize your spouse or your pastor? Or other people in positions of leadership, your kids' teachers in school, the church's youth pastor or youth director. How about your boss? Think about the people in your life, people, in, uh, people of leadership. Are you quick to try to correct them if you disagree? Do you criticize them directly to them or do you criticize them to others? Next question. Do you give undue time, attention, and effort to your physical appearance hair makeup clothing even your weight body shape trying not to look older do you give undue attention to your physical appearance evidences of pride next question are you proud of the schedule you keep? How disciplined you are? How much you're able to accomplish? You're a real producer at work. You're a real performer. Is that something that you're proud of? Are you driven to receive approval, praise, or acceptance from others? You always need to have a pat on the back. Have someone tell on you how well you're doing or you get discouraged. Are you driven to receive approval from others? That's the driving force in your life. How about this one? Are you argumentative? Do you have to have the last word? 
Think about what it's been like in your home the last week or two. You know, the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, Only by pride cometh contention. So where there's contention in the home, uh, some of you wives who may be listening online, you may be saying, yeah, I know my, my husband. I mean, he's a real proud man. That's why there's so much contention in the home. Well, I'm sorry, ladies. It takes more than just a proud husband to have contention in the home. More often than not, it takes a proud wife, too. Are you argumentative? Next question. Do you generally think that your way is the right way? The only way or the best way? Maybe you like your house cleaned a certain way or your spouse comes along and does it differently. Is your way the right way? It has to be done your way. And as I was going through and studying these, there were some of these that were very convicting even in my own life. Do you have to have things done your way? Next question. Do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit? You're easily offended. Do you get your feelings hurt easily? This is another one of those evidences of spiritual pride that Jonathan Edwards talked about. He says, people who take offense or get offended easily, he said, spiritual pride takes great notice to opposition and injuries that are received and is prone to be often speaking of them. Do you get all bent out of shape when your feelings are hurt? You get all bent out of shape and, do, and get mad about it? Do you pout? Do you cry? And when that happens, do you often complain about to other people in an event, uh, effort to get sympathy? Prone to speak of injuries that are received about yourself. Humility, on the other hand, causes a person to be like his blessed Lord when reviled. Quiet. Not, off, uh, not opening his mouth, but committing himself in silence to him that judges righteously. Don't complain about it. Let God deal with it. Do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit? Next one. Are you guilty of pretense? What's pretense? Trying to leave a better impression of yourself than is honestly true. Here's a way you might be able to measure this one. Would the people you know at church be shocked if they were to come over to your house and discover what you're like at home. Would the people you will know at church be shocked at the kind of movies you watch? Or the kind of music you listen to? Or the books you read? Or the language that you use? Uh, could be swear words or it could just be the way that you talk with each other. Inside the confines or the walls of your own home. Would these people be shocked? Do you try to put up a better front, make yourself look better than what you actually are? Pretense. Another good measure of this would be to take a look at your posts on social media. Hmm. Pretense. Trying to make people believe something about you that's not really true. The way we take pictures of ourselves and put it on social media. So they have a better opinion, opinion or think more highly of you. Pretense. Next one. Do you have a hard time admitting when you're wrong? It's hard for you to say, I was wrong. Or do you wait for the other person to say that they were wrong first? Next, do you have a hard time confessing sin to God or to others? Not just in general terms like, oh, I, I need to be a better spouse, I need to love the Lord more, I need to read my Bible more, I need to pray more. But when it comes to the specific issues, like I'm in love with food, or I'm in love with television, I love movies and entertainment more than I love God. The specifics. Do you have a hard time confessing those? And if you want a good guide to measure if you love these things more than God, ask yourself, how much time did I spend reading my Bible today? How much time did I spend in prayer today? You say, I just didn't have time to spend with God today, preacher. I mean, I had to work eight hours, and then I had to eat several times. I got at least an hour tied up in that, and I spent an hour or so in the bathroom. And then I was on social media for a couple of hours, and I watched TV for a couple of hours, and I surfed the internet for a couple of hours, and I played some online games or some video games for an hour or two, and then I had to go to bed. I just didn't have enough time to read my Bible, pray, or talk to God today, or spend time with God today, preacher. Oh, but I love God more than that stuff. Uh-huh. Right. 
You know, the scripture says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, that no man can serve two masters. And I'm pretty sure God can tell which master you serve despite what you say. Let me ask you this. Did you just get offended at me because I just hit the nail on the head? Do you have a hard time admitting that these things take more of a priority in your life than God does? Do you have a hard time confessing these things? Next one. Do you have a problem sharing your real spiritual needs and struggles with others? What's really going on in your heart? Sharing what goes on, or do you, you think, well, I can handle it myself. People don't need to know. I don't want them to think badly of me. Next one. Do you have a hard time uh, praying out loud with others? Are you shy? Next one. Are you excessively shy? You say shy. Well, how, you know, how can being shy be proud? Excessive shyness. What is it? Self-centeredness. What do other people think about me? That's an evidence of pride. Once again, what do other people think about me? Do you have a hard time reaching out to other people and being friendly to people that you don't know? Here's the next one. You stick to your own little group. It's hard to reach out to people. You, you, it's, again, what are they going to think about me? You know, another evidence of pride. You have a hard time making friends. Next one. Do you become defensive when you are criticized or corrected? You know, the anger, you get criticized or corrected, that anger begins to well up inside you. What is that? Well, that's a fruit that grows out of the root of pride. Why do we get angry when somebody criticizes us? We may not always express it outwardly, but we may feel it inwardly. Why? Because our pride got hurt. They criticize me. How dare they do that? They hurt my pride. Next one. Are you a perfectionist? The way you keep your house. The way you do your job. The way you raise your kids. Are you a perfectionist? Everything has to be just perfect. And you get impatient and upset with people who aren't. Pride. Next one. Do you tend to be controlling? of your spouse. And if you're not sure, ask them. Do you tend to be controlling of your spouse, of your children, of your friends, of people in your workplace, always trying to control or manipulate or manage, micromanage people and stuff like that, the people around you? you now, you may not do it consciously. That's why we need to ask the Spirit of God to dig up our hearts and dig the roots of pride out of our hearts and show us what, it, what is actually under the surface. And if you do that with a, with a sincere heart, He will show you that. The next one. Do we frequently interrupt people when they're speaking? You say, when you do that, what you're saying when you interrupt people is, what I have to say is more important than what you have to say. It's pride. Next one. Does your spouse feel intimidated by your spirituality? Spirituality. Um, how well you know the Bible, or how well you can pray, or uh, they feel spiritually inferior to you. And and, you know, and because some people have these kind of marriages where a husband might feel like he's just not as devoted to the Lord as his wife is. Well, what it may be causing that, it may be a superior sense that you're communicating, maybe without even intending or realizing it. Again, if you're in doubt, ask them. Do I come across as having too much spirituality? Next one. Does your spouse feel like they can never measure up to your expectations? What it means to, go, to be a good husband, or what it means to be a good spiritual leader, what it means to be a good wife, uh, what it means to be a good mother, how she's supposed to be, or how he's supposed to be, how handsome, how brave, how strong, that knight in shining armor, that image that ladies have pictured for their husband to be or how she's supposed to be how beautiful she is and guys often think that their wives will wait on them hand and foot and they are going to look awesome all the time a lot of time guys think that and and all of these things we get these imaginary pictures we've created of this wonderful perfect husband or wife in our life does your spouse feel like they just could not compare to the image that you have of what a husband or a wife should be 
Next one, do we often complain? Do you often complain about the weather? Do you often complain about your health, your circumstances, your job, your church? Complaining, how's that pride? You think you deserve better. This shouldn't be happening to me. I deserve better than this. It's pride. Next one. Do you talk about yourself too much? Are you more concerned about your problems, your needs, your burdens, than you are about other people's concerns? You always talk about yourself rather than caring about what's going on with other people's lives. Next one. Do you worry about what others think of you, about your reputation, about your family's reputation? By the way, that's one of the, one of the things that motivates us a lot of times when we parent, isn't it? What other people are going to think, what are they going to think if my child is this way, or acts this way, or dresses this way, or does these things, or doesn't do these things? It motivates us. What are people going to think about that? It's pride. Next one. Do you neglect to express gratitude for the little things? The little things in life that come to God, or to your spouse, or to others? Do you have an ungrateful spirit? You don't have to be thankful because you deserve it. That's pride. Next one, do you neglect prayer or reading your Bible? Do you neglect to pray or read your Bible every day? You say, how's that pride? Well, I'm saying I can live my life without God. I can manage without Him. Pride. Next one, do you get hurt if your accomplishments or acts of service are not recognized or rewarded in your home, at your job, in your church? Do you get hurt when your opinions and feelings are not considered? When your boss or your spouse is making a decision and you're not informed about the decisions that were made or the changes that took place or you weren't consulted and you got your feelings hurt? Do you react to rules? And many of us react to rules. Many of us have a hard time being told what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it my way. Do you have an issue submitting to authority? That's pride. Maybe you're thinking the next one. Maybe you're thinking, I'm not proud. I don't have anything to be proud of. I don't have any spiritual gifts. I'm not beautiful. I don't have any special achievements to be proud of. But you know what? If you're self-conscious about that, then that is pride. For example, if you're not a college graduate and others around you are a college graduate, maybe you get uncomfortable or intimidated when you're around people who are more educated than you. Or are you uncomfortable or intimidated around people who you believe are more beautiful than you or better looking or more talented than you or more physically fit than you are and, and you're self-conscious about being around them? That's pride. Next one, do you avoid participating in certain events for fear of being embarrassed or looking foolish? Do you avoid being around certain people because you feel inferior to them or feel like you just don't measure up to their standards? You can't, just can't measure up to their level. Next one. Are you uncomfortable inviting people to your home because you don't think it's nice enough or you can't afford to lavishly entertain? Next one. Is it hard for you to let others know if or when you need help? Maybe physical help or spiritual help or, or financial help. You have an independent spirit. I can do that on my own. I can do this by myself. I don't need anyone else's help. Pride. And this one is an excellent way to measure your pride quotient. When was the last time you said these words? To a family member, to a friend, to a co-worker, I was wrong. I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Now let me tell you, if it's been more than a month, mark it down on your list if you're keeping tally. Haven't you sinned in the last month? Have you been wrong? Wives, when the last time you said that to your husband, I was wrong, 
Will you please forgive me? Husbands, when was the last time you said that to your wives? I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Now, why is it so hard for us to say those words? Why? Because we're proud. We have to humble ourselves to say those words. And the last question, number 40, I'll give you this last question. Are you sitting here thinking about how many of these questions apply to someone that you know? I've seen some of you pointing. Are you sitting here thinking about how many of these apply to someone that you know? Or you're feeling pretty good that most of these things don't apply to you? Like, um, you, you, you want to get the link to this sermon online and send it to a dozen people that you know and say, hey, I heard this sermon online and, and you really need to watch it because it talks about some things that you need to change in your life. Or you need to you know, go make a CD copy of it and give it out to about a, to half a dozen people that you know. Thinking about how other people could benefit this, could that be an evidence of pride in your life? How other people could benefit rather than you? Now I have to go really quickly. I've only got about 15 minutes of time left. All of that was just my introduction, by the way. So I'm going to have to go really quickly on the rest. You know, in the book of Obadiah, that's only one chapter long, in verse 3, God speaks to the prophet Obadiah uh, to the people of Edom. And God says through the prophet Ob Obadiah, he says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. The pride of your heart has deceived you. It makes us blind. Here's what Charles Haddon Spurgeon, I quote him often, the Prince of Preachers had to say. Speaking of that verse in Obadiah, he said, Pride is self-deceit. Those who are sure that they have no pride are probably the proudest of all. Those who are proud of their humility are proud indeed. The confidence that we are not deceived may only prove the completeness of the deception under which we labor. And so we need to say, Lord, show me where I am being deceived. Has the pride of my heart, of my heart deceived me from being able to see what God sees in my life? Has the pride of your heart deceived you? made you blind to the real condition of your heart. As you seek the Lord today, say, Lord, show me what you see. Reveal my heart to me. Let me see it as you see it. Show me the pride of my heart. Excuse me. And as you do, as you do have the attitude, of, I will humble myself. I will repent. I will agree with you. And I will let you bring me to a place of humility. That's the starting place of revival. Humility. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. All of the rest that's in that verse, I mean it talks about praying and seeking God's face and repentance and all of that. Is a, but if we can't even humble ourselves, you can forget about the rest. It won't even matter. He's not even going to waste his time. And yet we want revival so badly. Let me quickly go on to the next part. As we try to get through this in these last now 12 minutes that we have together. So you say to me, okay, preacher, you've got me. I've got some pride in my life. I mean, I've got pride in my life. I can identify with things on that list, can't you? Amen. Amen. If you can't, you're lying to yourself. I've got some pride. Now, what do I do to get humility? Well, first, we need to realize that the issue of pride in our lives is no small matter. It is a big matter. It is a big, big deal to God. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. It's like God stiff arms the proud. He just stiff arms when they come by. I've, I've read in some commentaries on this verse that it's like God sets himself in battle array against those who are proud. Battle array is when the, the generals and they have everything around and they set the battle in motion. Their orders are carried around. The troops are going around. These are flanking these guys. These are attacking head on. Battle array. The battle is in motion. It is going on. Now I doubt 
I don't know. I, you know, I don't know about you, but I doubt, at least I don't, want the Lord to be set in battle ray against me. Do you want to be that way? I want to draw near to God. I want him to draw near to me. But we're seeing that the only ones that can do that are the humble, the lowly, the broken, and the contrite ones. So every vestige of pride in my life is something that keeps God at a distance from me. It keeps him away. It keeps us separated from God. And it keeps God setting himself against me. Imagine being opposed by the almighty God. We're sitting here saying, God, heal our country. Bring us revival. And God is out to get us instead. But that's exactly what happens when we're proud, when we don't humble ourselves, when we refuse to acknowledge our wrongs, and we refuse to accept responsibility for our actions and for our attributes. We make God our opponent. And what does God do to the proud? Well, over and over again, you see this all through the scripture. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. Those who walk in pride, he is able to abase. That means humble or lower or cast down. God will humble those who refuse to humble themselves. God is committed, and you'll see this all through scripture. God is committed to punish pride and to bring down the proud. I'm just going to read you a few verses about how God responds to the proud. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 2. When pride cometh, then shame. Then cometh shame. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Think about that. Is there pride in your home? Do you have pride going on in your home? Pride in your marriage? Pride in your heart? God says, I am going to work against your home. I'll tear it down. I am going to destroy that which is proud. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. Everyone that is proud of heart is an abomination to the Lord. He shall not be unpunished. You will be punished. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 8. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. Psalm chapter 101, verse 5. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer or tolerate. He won't tolerate you. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 32. The most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise them up. And Obadiah, verse 4, uh, this actually almost sounds like America as I read it. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence or from there will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Here's the principle. All through God's word. You lift yourself up, God will bring you down. He promises it. Count on it. You lift yourself up. It's true of an individual. It's true of a family. It's true of a church. It's true of our country. If you lift yourself up in God's way and in God's time, God will bring you down. But here's the other side of it. And what we need to do in our Operation Heal America Revival, based on 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if you choose to humble yourself, God will lift you up. He will exalt those who humble themselves, those who take their rightful place under God's authority. And so as I begin to wind it down, I want us to take a look at the most perfect example of Christian humility and how this principle is demonstrated in that, and that of course demonstrated by and in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, now, if you're a student of the Bible at all, you will know this passage of Scripture. But it's one that needs a refresher because we need to be reminded about what it truly means to be humble. And if we're going to seek the Lord, and if we want revival to spread across our land, then this is the spirit that I need to have and that you need to have. 
that we must have the spirit of Christ, that humble spirit. Paul begins in Philippians chapter 2, actually all the way through the book of Philippians, there's this theme of humility, as well as maybe some evidences of pride in the church at Philippi. If we were to look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul calls out two women by name, and he urges them, actually says he... Um, he says, I beseech, which means to beg. Paul begs them to be of the same mind in the Lord. What does that mean? Well, it means that they weren't of the same mind. They didn't get along with each other. Think about it. Two women working in the church don't get along with each other. I mean, I'm <laughs> right. Boy, we have that going on in the churches today, don't we? Women who can't get along with each other. And Paul calls them out by name, and he says they need to humble themselves. But here in Philippians chapter 2, we have a portrait of the most humble one who has ever lived, who also is the most exalted who has ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to begin reading at verses 1 and 2 of Philippians chapter 2. He's talking about the church here. So let me, let me read it. Philippians chapter, chapter 2 and verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any in comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, uh, if any bowels of mercies, verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He's talking to the church here. He's talking to a local church. He's like, hey, you there at the church of Philippi, or you there in Bath, New York, or wherever you live. He says, be of one mind. Be of one accord. He said, preacher, you mean we can't have differences with each other? We can't have disagreements? No, you're going to have differences. But you'll be able to humble yourselves, let go of your desire to have the last word, and, or, or the desire to prove that you're the one that's right and they're the one that's wrong. And love one another as you seek to serve the Lord and please the Lord. In your marriage, he says, you, husband and wife, be of one accord. That, that doesn't mean that the two of you aren't different. It doesn't mean that you don't have different strengths that you bring to the marriage. It doesn't mean that you can't have different opinions. But you both submit yourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's no longer she wants her way or he wants his way or her way is right or his way is right. And now there's this clash going on between them of which way they're going to do it. No, now there are two people who have come together and humble themselves, bowing their knees before the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ and they say, Lord, you're in control of this home. Lord, you, you are in control of this church. Lord, have your way, not my way, but have your way be done. That's how you become of one mind. When you start doing it for the sake of God rather than for the sake of yourself. And put your needs behind so that you can seek the will of God. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Don't do anything trying to upstage someone else. Trying to one-up someone. Or to get glory for yourself, vainglory. Or to make yourself look good. Or make yourself look better than someone else. Or to get praise of people. He says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. In humility, a humble mind. Now let me ask you, in your dealings with your spouse or your friends, or people in your little groups that you're in, how you, how you, the people that you hang with, the people that you work with, the people in your church, do you esteem all others as better than yourself? Esteem means to respect and admire. So when we have self-esteem, we are respecting ourselves and admiring ourselves. God says, no, the last thing you need is self-esteem. You need to esteem everyone else as better than you. Do you respect all others more than you respect yourself? Do you admire all others more than you admire yourself? 
I'll tell you, it'll make a world of difference in your marriage if you esteem your spouse as being more important and better than yourself. If you count them as being more significant than yourself. You say, well, who's going to worry about me if I do that? I mean, who's going to take care of my needs? God will. God will take care of your needs. If you humble yourself, God will take care of your needs. You say, well, I'll just be a doormat. I'll tell you what, ladies, if you approach your husband with a humble spirit, you'll probably find that your husband will put you on a pedestal so high he won't even be able to find you. Now, I can't promise you that that will happen. Your husband might not have a heart for the Lord, or you might be married to an unbeliever. But there's just something about us as human beings that responds to humility. When people humble themselves before us, there's just something about us that responds in kind. When you think about when you're dealing with your children, when they have, when, you know, th okay, so just parents, you know, think about this. When dealing with your children, when your children have, when they humble themselves, they have a, a teachable, a flexible spirit. When your children are respectful toward you, when they have a respectful attitude, aren't you a little bit more drawn to them? Aren't you, or, or don't you want to do a little bit more nice things for them when they are respectful to you? Rather than if they've got their arms crossed or they're rolling their eyes at you or they've got their hands on their hips or they're tapping their foot when they're disrespectful to you, when they resist your authority. When your children do that, doesn't it make you want to buck them, mom and dad? When your children are dis disrespectful, when they try to buck you, don't you want to buck them back? Doesn't it make you do that? I mean, come on, answer. Yes. Not yeah, doesn't it? God opposes the proud. But he draws near to the humble. So he says, I've got to wind it down. So he says, esteem others better than yourself. You can't do that by yourself. That's not natural. That's supernatural. We've got to have the spirit of Christ to do that. Verse 4. Uh, reading verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Don't just think about your stuff, your interests, your hobbies, your family, the things that are of concern to you. But look out for the interests of other people. Ask yourself if you're, you know, say you're going to go meet with somebody. It could be someone to witness to them or it could be a family member. Say, how can I reach this person? What things are burdening their, burdening their heart? What are their needs? What are their burdens? What are their concerns? Show an interest in others. When you get there, don't sit and talk about your problems and your stuff. Have a mind that is more concerned about their problems and their stuff. Verses 5 through 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. That's the heart of humility. Taking on the form of a servant. This is God, the creator of the universe, taking on the form of a servant. You say, well, I don't mind being a servant. I can serve in the church just as long as nobody makes me serve. Just as long as I get to choose where I serve and, where, and, and what I'm doing and how I'm serving, right? We say, oh, yeah, I want to serve in the church, but I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to do that. As long as it's convenient to me, God says, no, I want you to serve the way that the Lord Jesus served. Verse 7, he made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Here's the picture I want you to get. And this is the creator of the universe. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 and verse 14, where it says, in the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created and by, by Him and for Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse 14 it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. He's part of the Trinity. He was there. He helped create the universe. 
And here's the creator of the universe stooping down to wash the feet of the man who would betray him, Judas Iscariot, in John chapter 13, verse 4 through 17. The creator of the universe is washing the feet of someone who will betray him. Taking the form of a servant. You'll never be more like Jesus Christ than when you're humbling yourself to serve your family, or to serve in your church, and not where you want to serve, but where you're needed. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. There's another mark of humility. Obedience. Obedience. Someone who can be molded. Someone who respects and obeys authority. Someone who is responsive to God-given authority. He obeyed, listen, Jesus, he obeyed the law of God, and he obeyed the human authorities that God had placed in his life. He obeyed the human laws. How far did he go in that? How far did Jesus go in his obedience? Verse 8, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So what happened? Here's God's principle at work. You humble yourself, God will lift you up. Verses 9 through 11. Wherefore God also highly exalted him, hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And in closing, whew, verse gets me excited. And in closing, Peter says it this way, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. I want to challenge you. When you get up and you get dressed in the morning, I want to challenge you not to just put your clothes on, but put humility on. You better get it on. Before you leave your bedroom in the morning, you better get it on. Before you see your spouse, you better get it on. Before you see your children, you better get it on. Before you get to work, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And that grace is something you and I desperately need every day of our lives. But you'll never get God's grace until you learn to be humble. Verse 6 of our passage back there. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So husband, wife, when you go to bed tonight and you aren't speaking and his back is to you and she's not looking at you, she's, you, she's looking at the wall and your backs are to each other and there is a mountain of ice between you. Hurtful things have been said. He started it. She started it. He said, she said. You know, it really doesn't matter at this point, does it? And you're saying, why if you're saying, no, he needs to humble himself. Or, or, she needs, or he's saying, she needs to humble herself. Uh-uh. God says, you need to humble yourself. And race to the cross. Try to beat your spouse to it. Take on the mind, the heart of Jesus Christ, the servant. The one who puts the other person's interests above their own. Humble yourself. Be the first to seek forgiveness. When you've spoken sharp words to your spouse or to a family member, when you've disciplined your child wrongly or you've disciplined them in anger, seek forgiveness and say, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? In every situation and circumstance you face in life, there's a path you can take. Clothe yourself in humility. More of Christ, less of me. All of Christ, none of me. And you may think, well, I'm just going to get walked all over if I do that. My needs won't get met. God's word promises your needs will get met. God will draw near to you. He will look out for you. He will pour his grace upon you as you take a place 
of humility. If you don't, you set yourself up for a lifetime of God opposing you. That's what's happening in our churches today. Churches and our marriages and individuals' lives and our lives, our families' lives, our communities, even in our country. They're being opposed by God because of pride. God says, you want revival? Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, our scripture verse that we had, I revive the spirit of the humble. I revive the heart of the contrary. Everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around. This was a message to the church today, as I said at the beginning, that revival is not for lost people, revival is for saved people. But I will not let a service go where I don't have the opportunity to witness to someone about Jesus Christ. Is there anyone here who with an uplifted hand would say, Preacher, I am saved. I know that Jesus lives in my heart. I know that the Son of God lives in me. I know that I have been forgiven. I know that I am redeemed. I see your hands. God bless you. I love seeing that testimony. God bless you. But there weren't some, there were some hands that weren't raised here today. There were some hands that weren't raised. Would you say, preacher? You know, I, I, I'm listening to this. I know I got some things going on in my life. You know, but I, I would like to be saved. Would you please pray for me? I, I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you just left your hand and say, you know, preacher, just pray for me. I, I'd like to know that I'm saved. I, I'd like to know that I'm going to heaven. Would you please pray for me? Is there anyone like that? Maybe some of you out there listening online, you would be that way. Maybe you would say, Preacher, you know, I've got a problem with pride. And I think all of us do. I know as I was studying and preparing for this verse, I saw pride instances of pride there in my life. Would you say, Preacher, you know, I have a problem with pride and I would like to pray for you. Remember me in prayer when, when you have your closing prayer. Would you please pray for me, Preacher? Anyone like that? You raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray, please pray for me. I have a problem with pride. If you want to get saved, you want to you know, know Jesus, come and receive him as your Savior, you would say, Preacher, I would like to know that I'm saved. Maybe those of you listening online, Preacher, you know, I want to get saved. I need salvation. Even though this was a message to the church, I don't need to be revived. I need to be saved. Preacher, please tell me what I need to get saved. Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray out loud. You pray along with me. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, but I know that you came into this world and died on Calvary's cross, shed, shedding your precious blood to pay for my sin, to make a way so that my sin could be forgiven. I know that when you died on that cross, you paid the atonement of my sins. And I know that when you raised from the dead, that you defeated that sin. Lord Jesus, I confess and repent my sins to you. Please come into my heart and save me. Please forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. Come into my heart and save me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, that was just words, but if you meant it with an obedient heart, He will save you because the Word of God promises that He will. Maybe you'd say, I have a problem with pride. Lord, I would pray. First of all, I pray for all the people in this congregation who are not saved or not sure and for one reason or another were not able to come up. They didn't want to raise their hand. They didn't want to come up to the altar to pray. They didn't want to ask God to save them. I pray, Lord, that you will burden them with that need of salvation. How important it is that they get saved to make that lasting decision to accept you as the Lord of their lives. I pray that you will be with them, Father. Now I pray, Lord, that you will be with all of us who are suffering from pride. Dear God, we want revival. We want humility. We, we want to be able to humble ourselves so that you can revive our lives, revive our church, revive our country, Lord. From our house to the White House, the revival, we want this to spread. Lord Jesus, please help us to be able to humble ourselves. Show us the area in our lives where we have pride. Dear God, please let us be able to come to you and confess and repent of those areas. Please help us to get right with our families, with our friends, with our co workers with our children where we've been wrong and say I am sorry will you please forgive me please help us not to be so prideful and looking out for only ourselves and our selfish interests please help us to be able to consider others and esteem others as more important than ourselves please help us to be able to do that I pray these things in Jesus name just for his sake and to lift him up amen Friend, I hope that whatever is going on in your lives, you will get that squared away. 
you will get that settled and get that right. As we close our service today, think on your way home or as you go about your business or whatever else you do. Where is there pride in my life? How have I not been humble? Help me to get that right, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble.